Hi, I'm George Kaminsky with the Department of Ecology to present on the nature-based dynamic revetment construction at North Cove, Washington in the Pacific Northwest of the United States. David Cottrell, my co-author, will appear in this presentation as well. He's been the main manager on the ground with the construction project. Gavin Glor from the Pacific Conservation District has been involved with the initial design and who is from the organization who is sponsoring the project. The dynamic revetment at North Cove is intended to simulate the functions of natural cobble berms in the backshore zone of composite beaches in the U.S. Pacific Northwest. In this case, poorly sorted quarry spall material is used in the construction. The quarry spalls abrade and round over time in a high wave energy environment and is more economical than sourcing gravel and rounded cobble. The context of this project is along a historically and rapidly eroding reach of coast at the entrance to Willapa Bay. Over the past several decades, the shoreline has typically retreated tens of meters per year. The red circle in this 1999 image indicates the location of a persistent effort to maintain property over the past two decades, while the adjacent shoreline on both sides has retreated about 175 meters, resulting in the formation of a headland that has been maintained by routine placement of large rock. Most of the residential community has been lost over the past few decades. On the next slides, I will show photos taken from the area shown in the yellow oval. These photos characterize the impact of the erosion. This photo from 2002 represents a common scene along the shoreline over the past few decades. Each year, a different set of homes and properties would be lost to the erosion, with neighboring properties on deck for the following winter. The loss of homes resulted in much debris along the coast that created additional hazards and impacts. Here you can see examples of foundations, septic tanks, and building materials spread throughout the intertidal beach and iron pipes sticking out from the sand where homes used to be. A few years ago, the North Cove community formed a coalition for action called Wash Away No More. Their efforts included trying to slow the erosion at critical locations and road ends by placing pit run rock materials along the erosion scarp based on the knowledge of stability shown by composite beaches in the region. Conceptual designs for permitting were drawn up to convey the basic engineering with nature approach, allowing much latitude for adaptive construction and management using natural materials. Initial small scale efforts starting in the fall of 2016 at critical locations informed the design and construction that began at a regional scale of about two kilometers along the coast during the fall of 2018. In this talk, I'll focus on examples from these two sites shown by the red arrows. At the arrow to the left, at the southeast side of the headland, was an erosional hotspot with wave focusing. At the arrow to the right, toward the downdrift end of this beach, a log groin was constructed to capture sand that would otherwise be driven into a vital drainage channel during storm events. The next slide will show a video of a storm event impacting the shoreline at the southeast side of the headland at the arrow to the left. This January storm event followed the initial placement of quarry spall material. At the left side of the image, the waves are slamming into the barrier dune, with blocks of sand being pulled off by the colliding waves that reflect off the vertical face above the cobble at the scarp toe. Here, the amount of cobble placed was insufficient and the dynamic revetment was overwhelmed by the surge. On the right side of the image and further along the coast to the southeast, the dynamic revetment retained its capacity for wave dissipation and protected the uplands from further erosion despite being overtopped throughout the area. Note the reduced wave reflection along the section of intact dynamic revetment to the right where it retains a sloped surface up to the revetment crest. This series of photos shows the progressive development of the dynamic revetment and beach condition over time. In the column on the left, you can see the beach accretion over late winter through spring of 2019. Note the elevation of the sand and revetment toe relative to the large impounded log in the pocket on the beach at left. In the column on the right, the photos show the conditions from late fall 2019 to winter 2020 to present. By comparing the previous June at the lower left to the following November in the upper right, 
you can see the seasonal decrease in beach elevation. In the February photo from 2020, you can see the example of a rock berm that was placed near mean higher high water on the beach face below the exposed revetment toe above. The rock berm serves to dissipate incoming swash during the lower wave and tide conditions and induce sediment deposition on both sides. Of course, the rock berm can also be obliterated by a large storm event, but it nevertheless dissipates wave energy in the process and is shown to be an effective feeding mechanism to nourish the dynamic revetment and capture sediment and integrate it into the dynamic revetment along the lower portion. At this particular location, the rock berm facilitates the transition from an area of wave energy concentration and reflection at the headland to wave energy dis dispersion and dissipation along the adjacent shoreline, leading to a flattening of the curvature of the pocket beach between the headland and downdrift shoreline. You can see this effect by comparing the shape of the beach between June 2019 and September 2020. On the next slide will be my co-author, David Cottrell, explaining the evolution of the shoreline conditions at this location. His closing statement is somewhat difficult to hear, so it is transcribed in the space below. So this is where we did our very first test with dynamic revetment. This was the worst erosion hotspot on our whole, whole shoreline. And um, uh, I've watched 30 feet uh, wash away here in half an hour when the, when the winter storm surges were coming in. Yeah, it was just massive collision zone. So uh, in that environment, there wasn't anything we could do, but we decided to try something. So we put one load of, of unsorted uh, pit run rock out here just to see what the right size was. And amazingly, the waves sorted that material and spread it along the toe of the scarp and the angle softened just enough there uh, that we knew we were onto something. So we just kept feeding that as if it were a feeder bluff, adding material and watching it spread down the shoreline. And it's built up to, well, over the last three years, it's built, we've built it up to this level here. And as it's built up, you saw the driftwood start to accumulate up on the upper, on the upper shoreline here. Uh, you saw the sand coming in. Those high energy waves, when you slow them down, deposit a lot of sand. Uh, and as you see the yield graph, the vegetation coming in now. So in three years we've gotten to this. I'm guessing in a couple more years this will be a natural dune and, and you'll never know if this is constructed or in the road. Now moving downdrift to the log groin, this photo shows the maintenance and rebuilding of the groin in mid-February 2019. It began as a shorter version in 2017 and was effective in impounding driftwood and sand on the updrift side, as well as aid in accumulation of sand on the downdrift side to increase the backshore beach elevation and enhance dune growth. This next photo is another view of the log groin just a few days later. In January 2020, a camera was installed in the tree above the root of the groin to record the beach evolution with time lapse imagery. The next slide shows example images from this time lapse. This series of photos shows the beach evolution from January to March 2020 on the left and July to September on the right. You can see progressive increase in the elevation of the sand ridge centered along the axis of the groin as well as the growth of vegetation along the backshore portion of the groin. David Cottrell will discuss the purpose of the groin and the resulting beach changes in the next slide. So this is the log groin that we've built over the last few years. It, we had no idea that it was going to become this when we started, but we had this massive infra infragravity wave that was coming across a low sandbar here and up the mouth of our drainage ditch, and it was causing a lot of damage. And so we noticed under so, uh, some system, circumstances that the waves would leave wood at this point, and so we um, started building an engineered log jam kind of structure in his place thinking about uh, dolos and tetrapods as far as a loose open structure that would slow away rather than stopping it. And amazingly, it quickly started burying in sand as we took the energy out of those incoming waves that had been colliding. And uh, what you see now is a dune that's been built, built up over the last two winters. We've just kept extending the logs out as the sand builds. And this last year, we 
started adding dune grass into the system so that uh, we're hoping that the that from here on out that natural processes will take over and it'll just build a natural dune over the top of everything. I want to conclude this talk with a summary of some of the main lessons learned from this project. Although this was a rapidly eroding shoreline over the past several decades with a long-term trend that averaged tens of meters per year, the erosion typically occurred during a few winter storms each year or so. The project demonstrated that if we can protect the coast from erosion during these storms, the erosion trend may be halted. A second point is that incremental construction allows for subsurface layering and strata development and the integration of complementary materials over time. Allowing natural processes to, in, to engage with the construction enabled equilibrium slopes to develop and also allowed sediments to be sorted, layered, and distributed in ways that cannot be constructed by hand. Introduction of wood leads to sand deposition and more wood accumulation. And then vegetation introduction leads to more sand accumulation and greater stability, providing larger, more resilient storm buffer. Incremental construction also led to the realization that dissipation of swash with an active cobble layer was more important than building a large cross-sectional volume of material to absorb the wave energy. This can have substantial implications for construction cost and design. Importantly, we found that the integration of sand with a cobble is an important component to the shape, elevation, and performance of the dynamic revetment. As the project was adaptively managed to add cobble material as needed following storm events to shore up weak points, we found that innovative techniques such as placement of rock berms lower on the beach profile enhanced sediment deposition and accumulation across the beach face. This also led to the insight of nourishing the cobble revetment during and following accretion phases to take advantage of the ability to naturally integrate the accumulated sand volume into the revetment and backshore profile. A final point is that the functional performance is enhanced by small scale complexity with regard to cobble size, driftwood placement, and a range of morphologic shapes such as convex, concave, flat, and steep curvatures, as well as features such as hard points, ridges and runnels that naturally co-develop. Co Localized complexity and regional variability aid in the dissipation of wave energy and the enhancement of sediment deposition and an overall more stable coastline. I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the supporters of our monitoring program, as well as my coworkers at the Department of Ecology and collaborators Chris Blankensop and Paul Bale, with whom we've recently submitted two articles related to this project to the journal Coastal Engineering. Thank you.